So the, the videos that we saw, it, it, you may be already familiar with um, what is happening in the world and what is happening um, with the weather. I mean, we've experienced some of those things here in the state of Texas as well with the extreme cold that we've had. Um, and so by the way, good afternoon, Commission Ministries to another installment of our Zoom at Noon Fellowship, our online fellowship. Um, and we, we just finished watching a video um, that I'll leave a link um, uh, on the website so that you can go and watch it yourself. But I'm pretty sure that you're already familiar with some of the things that have been reported in the news. And so what God laid on my heart is to put together a series um, so that we can understand and have our understanding of what's happening in the world rooted in, in a biblical understanding. And so the title of the series is going to be called The Conditions of the Last Days. The Conditions of the Last Days. The title of this afternoon's message is Signs in the Earth, Creation Groans. That's our message today. And so the first question that I have in relation to this video and all the other things that we've been seeing, the winter storm that we've had here, the record-breaking hurricanes that we've had here, even in the state of Texas, the wildfires that are happening both in the West and 11 states here in the United States, uh, even in Canada, uh, Siberia, the record-breaking floods. There's been uh, rare snow in other places such as Brazil and, and Africa, South Africa, and they're experiencing their winter, but yet the rarity of snow uh, is something that we don't often see, even when they experience their wither, winters in the Southern hemisphere. And there's so many more things that have happened probably within the last 10 years. If you remember at the beginning of 2020, there were several hurricanes, I mean, several earthquakes, I think three in Puerto Rico alone in January, and so many other things that we've seen. So um, there's this huge debate about climate change that people are asking the question or denying this idea of climate change. But what I want to do as your pastor is ask another clap, another question. Is it climate change or is it something else? because we wanna always have our understanding rooted in a biblical basis. We wanna to go to the scriptures to answer questions because what we've done, and the other thing that, that prompted me to get this message together and get this series together, together, conditions of the last days, is that I'm finding that people are more and more turning to TikTok and using YouTube and other media sources as the basis for their understanding about how they determine what's happening. And I've even had someone recently ask me, you know, questions based off of TikTok videos. Well, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? And, you know, would you be willing to, you know, go to the Bible and, and reconsider what you're thinking? And I'm like, well, first of all, what I'm gonna need you to do is you go to the Bible and you change my mind. <laughs> about what the Bible says about the Bible, what the word of God says. I'm not gonna go use a TikTok video, but uh, that's becoming more prevalent that people are using these different sources to get their understanding and their information. And we have to be rooted in the word. So is it climate change or is it something else? What I believe is that the earth is groaning or it's in labor pains based on Romans chapter eight verses 18 through 22. It reads in the New Living Translation, yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against this will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Matthew 24, verses four through eight. When the disciples asked him, when will the end be? Jesus opened that, what we now know as the Olivet Discord, Discourse with this response. Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you. And I say this to you now, don't let anyone mislead you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many. 
and you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world, but all this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. So right now, the earth is groaning as in uh, a woman groaning as she's about to give birth. So the earth is experiencing birth pain. So the Bible personifies the earth as a living being. So we don't believe in mother nature, but the scripture itself does personify um, the earth as being something that is a, a living human being and they're experiencing birth pains and that the result of these birth pains is what we are experiencing seeing today. So what I believe, and rather than calling it climate change, because once again, that's something that has been politicized that we can debate. What we are seeing in front of our very eyes, we are seeing a record winter storm that has uh, taking out people's power and plumbing to this very day. There are people that are still displaced from their homes because the storm damaged their homes or their place of living. People died during the storm. So things that we can see with our own eyes, people are debating what exactly it is, whether it's climate change or whether that's a hoax. Well, what I see in front of me is no hoax. What I see in front of me is real. So there's no reason to debate that because we can all see it and we're all experiencing experiencing it. But what I wanna want you to understand is that we are living in the last days. And uh, there's a distinction between the last days and the end times. If you haven't watched my teaching on that, I encourage you to go on the website and find it or on the YouTube channel and find it. The end is what it's called. It's the end. It is the moment right, the moments right up before Christ returns, but we have been living in the last days since the first uh, advent of Christ. Since Jesus has come, that from that time up until we get to the better end will be the last days. So we are in the last days, no doubt. And as a result of living in the last days, Jesus himself said that there are going to be a lot of things that is going to happen. And some of these things or the signs or the conditions of the last days is what we are seeing happening in the earth. I'm going to read to you Isaiah chapter 24, verses one through seven. It says, look, the Lord is about to destroy the earth and make it a vast wasteland. He devastates the surface of the earth and scatters the people. And the title of this, you know how your Bible will give you uh, bite-sized pieces. They break up the chapters and the verses and they'll name it. This chapter is named God's purpose in judgment, destruction of the earth. Picking up, it says he devastates the surface of the earth and scatters the people. Priests and lay people, servants and masters, maids and mistresses, buyers and sellers, lenders and borrowers, bankers and debtors, none will be spared. The earth will be completely emptied and looted. The Lord has spoken. The earth mourns and dries up. The earth mourns and dries up, right? And the crops waste away and wither. Even the greatest people on earth waste away. The earth suffers for the sins of its people. For they have twisted God's instructions, violated his laws, and broken his everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse consumes the earth. Its people must pay the price for their sin. They are destroyed by fire and only a few are left alive. The grape vines waste away and there is no new wine. All the merrymakers sigh and mourn. The cheerful sound, of, so that's where I said I was gonna stop. Verse seven, did y'all hear this? Did y'all hear what the scripture is saying? So while people are debating whether climate change is real, the scripture is saying that the earth is suffering as a result of the people's sin. This goes all the way back to the curse in Genesis chapter three, that the ground was cursed, but 
the scripture further elaborates in other chapters and verses and it goes into detail and says that it's not just the ground that curse is cursed, but the entire earth and everything in it is experiencing and suffering and reeling and groaning and moaning as a result of people's sin. So while we can debate whether or not this has ever happened before, we can debate whether or not that it's climate change, whether the, the there's a hole in the ozone layer, who cares? <laughs> Our biblical and spiritual understanding and foundation, we can go to the scriptures and we have an answer. We have an understanding for what is happening and what is going on. And what this is what I say about whether or not we can call it climate change or not, it doesn't really matter, but this is what I say. It could be both. I don't see climate change and what the Bible says as being things that are two completely opposite things or being diametrically opposed. I say it's both. It's both climate change and labor pains. However, the problem with the idea of climate change is that climate change conceals God and the earth groaning as in labor pains reveals God. Did y'all catch that? Climate change conceals God, but the earth itself groaning as a result and the suffering of our sin, that reveals the handiwork of God. It reveals the plan of God. It reveals the sovereignty of God. Whereas climate change separates and detaches us from any spiritual consequences, from any spiritual ramifications, from a plan, from judgment. And it relinquishes God's people from the responsibility of confessing and repenting from sin. That's the problem with the argument of climate change. So what is the solution then? Because if it's climate change, as people say, and as we have discussed, and when it, as we have heard, and as we saw these videos blaming this on cli climate change, well, then what is the response? Is it, uh, is it God's plan or man's efforts that will save us? The condition of the last days described in Matthew 24 punctuates the finite timeline of creation. So if you read all of Matthew chapter 24, it describes in great detail what is gonna happen in the last days and what will ultimately culminate in the end times with the second advent of Christ and the return of the Yeshua HaMashiach. It is a, it is a finite timeline, meaning that the earth has an end time. It has a finite, it will not go on forever. And while I believe in so-called climate change and that we are experiencing rapid changes to our environment, we are indeed experiencing changes and rapid changes to our environment. I don't necessarily agree with the cause. The scriptures have foretold this phenomenon. While scientists scramble to try to explain and understand what they failed to do is to reveal the judgment and the handiwork and the plan of God. Environmental conversation, a, con a conservation rather, environmental conversation is and always has been our responsibility as evidenced by the, by the directives given to Adam and Eve in the garden. However, mankind will not be able to recycle our way out of judgment or the judgment that is placed on the earth. I don't care how many water bottles you crush and take to the recycling plant. I don't care how many cans you pick up. I don't care how many times you, uh, you, you, you know, you compost and you, you take your cardboard boxes to no, you know, no shade to nobody. We will not be able to recycle our way out of judgment. And so while people say we can reverse this and we can change this, if we would just recycle, if we would just reduce our carbon emissions, if we would just all become vegan so that the, the plants that process the meat and kill the animals would stop releasing these carbon emissions into the ozone layer, that's a result of our sin. I see that as all connected. Mankind is greedy, careless, and sinful. We didn't do what God told us to do, which was to tend to the garden, to be responsible for the earth, to take care of it in the garden. 
we chose to sin and do other things. It wasn't enough for us to do what God said to do. And from that time to this time, we have been abusing the planet and we have been walking in disobedience and living in sin and misusing our resources and uh, uh, synthesizing things that are not compatible with God's creation. It's all sin. It's all sin. So we are reaping the fruit of our consequences. We are reaping the fruit of our actions, rather. The consequences are direct relation to the sinfulness of mankind and the bad and poor stewardship of what God has given to us to care for the earth. It's all connected. And the earth is suffering and groaning as a result of it. But if it's merely climate change, then we can fix it ourselves. And this is what I want you to understand as we study the conditions of the last times and we decipher and pull away from the world's narratives of what we use to explain and understand what's going on. Because if it's climate change, right? Then we can fix it ourselves. And this is what you call secular humanism. Secular humanism is an ideology where uh, uh, people believe that there is ne uh, not necessarily a higher power and that because of that, we don't have to depend on a higher, a higher power to make our society better, to make decisions, to make our world better, to make our lives better, to be kind, to be moral to one another, that we can do that ourselves. That's the secular humanist per perspective. And I know full well because Star Trek is based on a secular humanist perspective. And while I love Star Trek, I'm a Trekkie, I fully recognize the theologies and the, well, not the theologies, but the ideologies that are incompatible with the scriptures, that we will get better in the future because we will evolve, we will advance. That's not true. Mankind, the word of God says that there's none righteous, no, not one. And that there is nothing new under the sun. That's what the word of God says. So therefore, we can't fix this ourselves because it's not just this idea of environmental change. It is judgment. And it's already been written and it's a part of God's plan. So I'm going to say this again, I'll make this statement. If it's merely climate change, we could fix it ourselves. But if it's already been written and it's a part of God's plan, then let God be true and every man a liar, Romans 3 and 4. Since we know it's God's plan, then the climate change narrative without God is a deception and a false teaching, which is characteristics of the last days. And we know in Matthew 24 and in many of the scriptures, particularly in, in Titus, first and second, I mean, first and second Timothy, that it talks about false teachers and uh, um, deception. And in the Olivet Discourse, it talks about deception. And so this idea that it's merely climate change is part, and the narrative of that is a deception and a false teaching, not the fact that we are experiencing rapid changes to our climate and our environment. That's not a lie. We can see that, but the narrative is what's deceptive. And it's also characteristics of the last days because what it does is it shifts the focus away from God and the fact that God has already told us this was going to happen so that mankind won't repent, that mankind won't say, oh my God, help us, Lord, forgive me. That's what it does. And it puts the responsibility and a false hope in man. Oh, oh Jesus, come on somebody. First John chapter two, verses 15 through 17. Do not love the world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. So this scripture is telling us that the world is fading away. 
um, Second Peter, let me read that real quick. Chapter three. It says, this is my second letter to you, dear friend, starting at verse one. And in both of them, I have tried to stimulate your wholesome thinking and refresh your memory. I want you to remember what the Holy Prophet said long ago and what our Lord and Savior commanded through, most, through your apostles. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers, don't we have scoffers? Don't we have people saying that this isn't real, that the weather isn't any worse than what it used to be? And here's the problem with the narrative of climate change. People deny climate change. Corporations deny climate change because it absolves them of any responsibility for poisoning the earth, poisoning our water sources, for being greedy and so on and so forth. And they get into the pockets of our politicians and encourage them to deny it as well, even though we all see what is happening and we all see what is going on. It makes people have a reason to argue that it's not even real, that what you see happening is not even real. So the deception is a, a, a multi-level deception to conceal God, to conceal judgment, to conceal the plan of God, repentance and salvation, to deny the truth of what you see around you so that you can sit in a pot of wa boiling water like a frog and the heat is turned up around you till the point that you die. The deception is multi-level. So we have scoffers because people disagree with the argument. What I've also learned is that uh, along political affiliations that the denial is even more uh, uh, real. That along political affiliations, people will tend to disagree with this idea that what we are experiencing is not real so that people won't repent. Bless you, Lord God. I didn't got all off track. Then in the last days, scoffers will come mocking the truth. Come on now and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? I just said that I'm getting ahead of myself. From, the, from before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. And that's what people are saying. Come on now, it's in the scriptures. This is what I'm telling y'all. That while we watch the news and we, we try to understand what's happening in the news, the news and social media can't tell you the truth. You better get in the word and know and understand the conditions of the last days. You better get in the word because people are saying that things have happened the same way since the world was created. They deliberately, they deliberately forget that God made the heavens in the world by the word of his command. And he brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with the mighty flood. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for what? Fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. But you must not, must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord and a, th a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really slow about his promise as some people think. No, he is being patient for your, for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to do what? Repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise and the very elements themselves will disappear in what? Fire. And everything and, in, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live. Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along, on that day, he will set the heavens on what? Fire and the elements will melt away in flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth he has promised, a world filled with God's righteousness. 
this passage confirms the new heaven and the new earth described in Revelation 21. So while this narrative, and I'm using this word, understand the narrative of climate change, people can debate the narrative, but what you cannot do as a believer is deny the word of God. You cannot debate the word of God and you cannot ignore what you see happening around you when you read the scriptures that the word of God is saying that the earth is groaning as in child pains, as in birth pains, as a child in labor. And that when you see these things happening in the earth, as Yeshua said, that it is only the beginning. This is the first of the labor pains. And for those of us who have, who have, had, who have had children or watched our children come into the world, I'm getting excited, y'all pray. For those of you who have watched your children come into the world like I fought for your fathers, you know that it comes in stages. And that as the child gets closer, the labor pains intensify and become closer. And so, but here's the beautiful thing about childbirth is that as the pains intensify, we are, at, we are waiting for a child to be reborn. We are waiting for the earth to be reborn, a new heaven and a new earth. So that is the hope. And so while other people who deny God or mourning, believers are waiting with expectation for God to destroy everything and start over and create a new heaven and new earth, knowing that while they may destroy our bodies, God is going to renew our souls and he's gonna give us a new body along with the new heaven and the new earth. He's, we're going to take off the corruptible and put on the incorruptible. So that is our hope. And that is what we can look forward to as we examine the conditions of the last days. Please understand that this is what is happening and this is what is it we are experiencing. And that as believers, we should not cling to the narratives that the world give us. We should look to the word. When we see something happening, we should look to the word or it should jog our memory. The Holy Spirit and what we've studied in the scriptures should jog our memories and we should go and look for an explanation in the word. And so what I'm giving you that as we explore the series of the conditions of the last days, the earth groaning is one of those signs and one of those symptoms of the conditions of the last days. Amen, and I'm almost done. So we should take clues, as I, as I finish up, we should take clues from the Olivet Discourse. So remember the Olivet Discourse is what, uh, what Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 24. And let me go to it real quick. And I'm just going to read the first couple of verses. Matthew chapter 24. And the reason why it's called the Olivet Discourse. But this blew my mind. Uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 1. As Jesus was leaving the temple grounds, his disciples pointed out to him the various temple buildings. But he responded, do you see all these buildings? I tell you the truth, they will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. Later, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately and said, tell us what, when all this will happen. What sign will signal your return and the end of the world? And then Jesus told them and he went on to describe it. But he was sitting on the Mount of Olives. Now here... Those who have an ear to hear, let them hear. This is how awesome God is and how the word of God, we know that we can rely on the word of God to give us an understanding of what we see and what we are experiencing. So it's called the Olivet Discourse because obviously he was sitting in the region or sitting on the Mount of Olives when this question was posed. But Jesus is awesome. God is awesome like that. Jesus described the last days to his disciples while sitting in this location. He spoke of destruction and judgment on the earth 
and against people. Jesus gave this very warning on the Mount of Olives. But it is, and I'm reading from my commentary um, in my Bible, I have a little commentary. It's the New Living Translation Study Bible. And there's a commentary down at the bottom. So I'm citing my source. These are not my words, but I'm citing my source. And it says that it is the very place where the prophet Zechariah in chapter 4, 14, verse 4, had predicted that the Mashiach would stand when he came to establish his kingdom. So I'm going to read to you out of Zechariah chapter 14, starting at verse 1. Watch for the day of the Lord. Watch for the day of the Lord is coming when your possessions will be plundered right in front of you. I will gather the nations to fight against Jerusalem. The city will be taken, the houses looted, the women raped. Half the population will be taken into captivity and the rest will be left among the ruins of the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fought in times past. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives will, Olives will split apart, making a wide valley running from east to west. Half the mountain will move toward the north and half toward the south. You will flee through this valley for it will uh, reach across to Azal. You will flee as you did from the earthquake in the days of King Uzziah of, Ju of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come with all his holy ones with him. Bless you, Lord God. So it's describing what, they, what the Bible defines as the day of the Lord. And in the teaching that I did about the difference between the last days and the end times is that the day of the Lord typically talks about the end. The day is the actual end and the series of destructive events that will happen immediately before the return of the Lord. But it says that he will stand on the Mount of Olives. Now, so it is no uh, coincidence to me that Jesus gave this sermon on the Mount of Olives when he talked about the day of the Lord and the last days, the events leading up to the last days. So as we continue the conditions of the last days, um, the series, I will pick this up the next time I preach, which will be more than likely on first Sunday. Um, so second and third Sunday will be, um, if uh, Minister Latonia is up to it on third Sunday, uh, but Minister Rhonda will be preaching on the second Sunday, but I will pick this sermon up uh, and we will continue to talk about the conditions of the last days because considering what is going on, we are still in the pandemic. Despite what our politicians may say, despite what people may believe, and I want y'all to hear me, hear me and hear me well. And this is what I'm talking about when I say that we allow the media, YouTube, social media, TikTok, talk, tick, TikTok, a talk, Snapchat, all of this other stuff to tell us what we should believe. When we see people passing away from the virus, when we see the conditions around us, we see the wildfires, we see the floods, we see the hurricanes, we see all of this stuff, and yet we are allowing the media to tell us what all of this stuff is and what is going on and how to respond. Saints, I need y'all to pray. I need you to get into your word like never before. And I need you to read and do your research. If somebody sends you a video that says, oh, this is what this is, this is what that is, what I want you to do is if you're not going to do the research to confirm or deny what somebody sent you in a video, then don't watch the video. Because you have to read and research for yourself. You have to read the scriptures. And you have to read evidence. Don't just take one person's word for it or a video. Do your own research. Go to government websites. Look at data and reports. And then pray. And go back to the scriptures. 
This is what we have to do. We cannot be lazy. And we cannot allow ourselves to continue to be deceived. Because even Christians are talking about climate change. When what we should be doing is sounding the clarion call of God to say, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. 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 This is what we should be doing and saying as believers. That it's not climate change and we're not gonna be able to recycle our way out of this coming judgment. And here's the thing that is interesting to me as I was reading about what they say about climate change. And like I said, I can agree with the idea that the, the climate is changing, but I don't agree with the cause because I know what the word says. But here's what's interesting that points to me back to the scriptures because the world is not going to be flooded, a worldwide flood, even though we do see floods. The world is going to be consumed by fire is what the scripture says. One of the ways that the world will be judged. Well, here's the thing about what the scientists say about climate change is that the temperature, overall average temperature of the earth is rising. And even when it rises just by a few degrees over a sustained period of time, you're gonna see cataclysmic, cataclysmic shifts. So while floods are normal, monsoons, tropical systems, and those things, we've experienced those. If the temperature is hotter, then it creates more moisture in the air so that when the temperature does rise and it rains, the rain is going to be so much more than normal because of the heat. If it's hotter and the wildfire season is normal, but the heat causes a drought, then when the wildfire season that happens, which is normal, the, the fires are more intense. They are stronger, they last longer, and they consume greater territory because of the fact that there is a drought, but it's because of the heat. And the word of God says that the world is gonna be consumed by fire. So that is interesting. All of these ca catastrophes, whether it's floods or winter storms or wildfires or extreme temperatures or heat, they are all caused by a rise in heat, in temperatures and so on and so forth. But the word of God says that the earth is groaning. So while the world may claim a narrative about climate change, we should be preaching the gospel in the meantime, as we examine the conditions of the last days. So I just wanted to uh, uh, bless you with this word. And I wanted to encourage you to continue to do the work of God, to continue to preach the word, to continue to live the word. And while we all are experiencing our own individual problems, our own individual um, situations and circumstances, I still have to remind you that we are living in the last days and we have a commission. We have been commissioned to go and make disciples, to teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that Yeshua has given us and his disciples. And that is why I say that we have to get our lives together and we have to get our lives right. Because if we are so consumed in our own personal turmoils, then how can we even possibly think that we can be a witness? Because we're gonna to be too consumed by what we're dealing with. Amen, amen. So I wanted to bless you. I pray that you guys will have a great afternoon and that you will also go back and listen to this message and other message that I will, messages that I will probably put along uh, on the website. And if you came in a little bit late uh, for this afternoon's Zoom fellowship, the message will be up shortly after within the hour so that you can go back and listen to this message, look at the, the scriptures, 
and to look at the, um, the companion messages that will help you to understand what we are dealing with. Pray saints of God. And we will see you again on the prayer call on Wednesday night as we continue to put God first in everything we do and to hear the word of God and to be watchmen and seers and to be his mouthpiece. Amen. God bless.